test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press 1. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is 692411. 692411. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers? Uh, no. The company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow or manila? Um, we'll have the plain white, please. Uh, but the ones with the little windows. OK. One box, A4, white. Just the one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um, as a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white, then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets to the pack. Right, let's see. Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists, so can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Anything else that we can help you with? Um, uh, let me think. What else do we need? Uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Uh, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right. Floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then, uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't, but could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. 
you'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And、um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after eleven thirty a.m. Because I have to go out at twelve. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past eleven. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Listen to a man talking to a group of people at a weekend work conference in a hotel. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Okay. Can everyone listen again now, please? Now you know how much of the weekend will be work, and what some of the meetings and sessions are about. I'd like to tell you something about how you can spend some of the free time you have over the weekend, both inside the hotel and outside in the town centre. As I've said, you'll be free from around five today, and on Saturday and from lunchtime on Sunday, and there's plenty to do. This is the first time we've had the conference at the Royal Spa Hotel, and I'm sure you'll agree it's a very nice place. Really, there's no need to leave the hotel at all if you don't want to, but I'm sure some of you will want to get out for a change of environment. Okay, first, restaurants and bars. I'm sure you all saw that there was a bar near the entrance as you came into the hotel, but there are actually two more bars. One is also on the ground floor, behind the main restaurant, and the other is on the top floor. That one has a very nice terrace where you can sit outside and enjoy the view. That bar is for hotel guests only and is usually a bit quieter. As I say, the main restaurant is on the ground floor. We will have breakfast and lunch there, so you'll get to know it well. There is also a smaller restaurant for coffee, sandwiches, and snacks on the third floor, and that is also only for hotel guests. There is a gym and health club in the basement. The gym has a good range of equipment and is open from 7 a.m. I know some of you were talking about a swimming pool, but unfortunately there is no swimming pool. I will tell you where there is a pool close to the hotel in a moment. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty.
You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, I hope to see some of you around the hotel over the weekend, but I'm sure you will want to get out and see the town at some point. If you'd like to look at the map on the screen, I'll show the area around the hotel. There is a map of the town centre in your welcome pack too. Okay, you can see the hotel here in the middle of the map. And the main entrance here at the top in Carlisle Street. Okay, that swimming pool I promised to tell you about is here in Cromwell Road. If you turn right out of the hotel, it's about ten minutes up the road in the Third Street on the left. It's open until seven p.m. and until five on Sunday. There's a very nice park here to the north, again about ten minutes away. In the middle of the park is a boating lake, so if the weather's good on Sunday, it might be a nice way to relax. If you want to see a movie this evening or on Saturday night, the cinema is here in the High Street. Come out of the hotel and turn left. The High Street is only three minutes away. The cinema is here at the top of the street, next to a fairly large car park. Now. Restaurants. There is a good Chinese restaurant in the middle of the high street, here on the right. It's directly opposite the town hall. It's called the White Orchid. Another very nice restaurant is Leonardo's. It does Spanish and Mexican food. It's here at the bottom of the high street. So, turn left at the end of Carlisle Street, walk down for five minutes. And you'll see it on the other side of the road. I went to Leonardo's last time I was here, so I can recommend it. Now, if anyone wants to see some live music, there is always a jazz band playing at the Pink Coconut. Yeah, that's right, the Pink Coconut. That's here in a little street behind the hotel. The street name is not on the map, but it's easy to find. Turn right out of the main entrance, and then take the first right to go back round to the back of the hotel. So, I think that's everything. Please ask me if you have anything else. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a female and a male student talking about the mock exams that they have just taken. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, what did you think of the practice exams last week? You mean the mock exams? Yeah, I thought some of them were tough. They were certainly hard, and generally they were very long. Yeah, they were spread over a whole week, which made it impossible to relax. Exactly, but what did you think of each test? Of the seven exams we did. The least enjoyable for me were the two three-hour essay papers. Why didn't you like the essay papers? I'm not particularly good at writing things down like that in a short space of time, and I don't think it's a good way of testing our theoretical knowledge of medicine. I'm the opposite, I'm afraid. I'm much better in the written essay exams than the other types of tests. But what about the two multiple-choice exam papers in basic science and anatomy? They weren't too bad. If you didn't know the answer, all you had to do was guess.、Mm, 
that's okay, but I never feel comfortable with guessing. And you know that there is research that shows that women are disadvantaged when doing multiple choice questions compared to men. You've mentioned this before, but I'm not sure I believe it. It's true. Multiple choice questions benefit men more than women. They are a male construct. If you say so. It's not if I say so. Anyway, you have to be careful with multiple choice questions because of the negative marking. That can really bring the score down if you keep guessing and get all of the guesses wrong. It's double negative. Yeah, that is a danger. What about the role play? Did you like that? Yeah, with the actors and actresses as simulated patients. Yeah, I thought that was by far the best part of the exam. Why was that? What I liked about it was during the 24 test stations, we had a chance to show what we know about communicating with patients and show our practical medical knowledge, etc. Yes, I think I agree with you there. I enjoyed all of the stations, but I can tell you I was tired at the end. I have done a practice exam with 12 test stations, but not 24. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. I agree completely. It lasted nearly four hours in total with the break. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What did you think of the other two exams? The two problem-solving tests? Hmm, I didn't think I was going to handle them very well. But in the end, I think they went better than I thought they would. What I liked most was the test where we had to work in groups of four and to solve a problem, we had to prioritise actions. That was very interesting. I'm not sure that I did very well in that, though. Did you feel comfortable being in a group of four and having four examiners watching you as you discussed the problem? We did practice it several times before. You learn to forget that someone is watching you. But some people are better at speaking in group situations like that and they get the best marks. The test doesn't just assess whether people can talk a lot. It's about showing you can listen Organise your thoughts and then show you can be part of a team, allowing other people to speak. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. When do the results of the mocks come out? They said next week, and then it's the finals two weeks later. Yeah, we've got that to look forward to. What is the policy on resets? Why? Are you planning to fail? No, but, well, you know what I mean. The resets are held in September, and if there is any problem after that... It goes to appeal. We'll just have to make sure we don't fail any part of the whole examination. I certainly wouldn't want to do any of it again. Me neither. It's hard when you are not allowed to fail any of the exams. I bet they don't have that policy in any other subject. Probably not. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on the effect of architecture on people's mood. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My group has been doing a project on the importance of architecture in people's lives and whether it has any impact on the lives of people in general. The main part I have played is in the collection of data to find out what effect, if any, various buildings have on people's mood, i.e. whether ugly buildings make people unhappy and whether beautiful buildings do the opposite. We had originally thought of starting measuring people's reactions by using a questionnaire with about 40 questions, which we were going to hand out to people, including students at the university. But we were worried that doing the questionnaire would be too time-consuming for people to fill in, so we gave up the idea. I then asked several of the postgraduate students for advice. One of them came up with the simple idea of showing people images of various buildings from different eras and styles, instead of giving out the questionnaire, and asking them to indicate how they felt on a scale of 1 to 5 about the images, where 1 was unhappy and 5 was very happy. People would also be given the option of not saying what they felt. Using the scale meant that it would be much simpler to record people's reactions. I decided to follow this advice, and so the first stage was to collect a large number of images. I used Google to print off colour images of views of houses and apartment blocks where people live, and different types of buildings where they work. I started with about 30 or 40, and then reduced them to 10 images. Media resources in the Amory building at the Judd Street branch of the university helped me produce the final images. I had them blown up to A4 size, and we used colour rather than black and white to make the detail on the images clearer. We made five sets of images, and for protection when handling, we pasted the images onto hard card. Then, using a machine to wrap them with plastic, we laminated the cards. Five of us targeted different age groups. We went to a local school where we obtained permission to ask a group of teenagers between 11 and 18. We also asked a sample of the general public, including tourists from all over the world, as they exited the Tate Modern in London, what they thought. We aimed to ask people from different age groups, namely 20 to 40 and 50 and over. What our group learnt most from the project was first of all the value of teamwork. And secondly, we found that we had to appoint a leader to stop us pulling in different directions and falling apart. So this turned out to be an invaluable lesson for all of us. As to the findings, for us they proved intriguing. In the end, the sample consisted of 311 respondents. I thought initially that people wouldn't be interested in taking part. With the youngest age group, their reaction was very mixed. It was clear that the youngest group had no pattern of preference at all, as they frequently gave no reaction to the pictures. For the 20 to 40 age group, we found that they tended to score more in the middle range, around three. We found that out of the three groups, the most likely to be favourably affected by the images that is, they were more likely to score the images as five, were those aged 50 and above. And nobody in this age group failed to say what their reaction was, which was unique for the three groups. In total, I have to say that about 71 people indicated that they had no reaction at all to an image. Our general conclusion is that we need to find out more about why people react as they do, by perhaps giving them a chance to give reasons for their decisions. I would like to finish there and give my teammates a chance to add anything I've missed or take any questions or suggestions. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
guest i am simran and i am a new member of the team ielts dream today in this video i will discuss with you task 1 of writing module so without wasting any time let's start the video our question is the chart below shows the expenditure of two countries on consumer goods in 2010 summarize the information by selecting and reporting the main feature and make comparisons where relevant now have a look on the chart so this is our bar graph and the spending was on cars computers books perfumes and cameras in the two countries france and uk and the expenditure was given in pounds so in an overview what we can see is the maximum spending and the minimum spending in both the countries are same that means the maximum spending was for car and the minimum spending was for perfumes in both the countries the rendered bar graph illustrates the expenditure on consumer items in france and uk in the year 2010 overall it is conspicuous from the graph that maximum and minimum spending in both countries was on cars and perfumes respectively so as you can see the maximum spending in both nation is on cars and the minimum spending is on perfumes explicitly the amount spent on cars in uk was 50000 pounds more than france which was 450000 pounds so as you can see the amount spent on cars in uk is 50000 pounds more than the amount spent on cars in france now moving to computers the expenditure differ by 30000 pounds in both the nations so as you can see if we talk about computers the difference between the expenditure is almost 30000 pounds now turning to books the amount spent was 300000 pounds in france whereas 100000 pounds were more spent in uk let's have a look so as we said the amount spent in france for books was 300000 pounds and in uk it was 100000 pounds more than the books purchased in france with respect to perfumes the difference between the consumption was not too high and accounted to 220000 pounds see the only difference between the consumption of perfume is 20000 it is 105 150000 pound and this is 200000 pounds lastly the expenditure on cameras in uk was double the amount spent in france so the expenditure in uk was 400000 pounds which was double the amount spent in france that means in france the spending on cameras is 200000 pounds as you can see the spending on cameras in france is 200000 pounds and the spending on camera in uk is 400000 pounds so this was for today i'll meet you in the next video if you like the video do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel till then bye bye and take care test i am simran and i am a new member of the team ielts dream today in this video i will discuss with you writing task 2 so without wasting any time let's start the video as you can see our question is some people like to live in joint families whereas some prefer nuclear family discuss both views as some people prefer to live in small families and some people prefer to live in big families so we have to discuss both the views 
starting with the introduction family is the biggest strength for almost everyone but preference over the number of family members is different some people feel loved with the number of people in the family but other take it as a crowd this essay will discuss both the views right this is our paraphrasing in which we said that some people love to live with a number of pe person in the family but other take it as a crowd so they prefer living in nuclear family now in body paragraph 1 we will discuss about those people who prefer to live in joint families some people prefer to live in joint families as they feel secure because they have experienced ones with who can advise guide and support them as in the joint family we have our grandparents and they are more experienced than us right so they can advise guide and support us in allied to it in this fast paced world living in joint family can work as a boon it can be as a boon boon means vardan where both parents are working so they have many people who can take care of children right so if the parents are working so the other family members can take care of their children many people in joint family are less likely to suffer from loneliness and depression as sanu pata hai je apna joint family ch reh rahe ho to utthe loneliness aur depression da te koi chance hi nahi hai correct increasing incidence of kidnapping and human trafficking is a worrisome issue this will be lesser because there will be number of people to take care of children now human trafficking or kidnapping is a worrisome issue that means it's increasing right it's a worrisome issue means gives you worry about your children but if you have number of people to take care of your children then it will be lesser in that case now in body paragraph 2 we will discuss about those people who prefer living in nuclear families on the other hand some dwellers feel comfortable to live with less number of family members as in nuclear family they feel free and independent right there are no restrictions you can do whatever you want to so they prefer nuclear families they may take other members as a burden on them in nuclear family what have will happen that there are less number of people but if they live in joint families they can take other members as a burden on them to illustrate in india mostly grandparents are unemployed and fe people feel it difficult to feed them correct because they are unemployed so people think that they can't feed them as they don't have that much of income there may be some disputing issues in joint family which may affect relationships right ladai jhagde ho sakte hain joint family which which may affect the relationships which will in case of nuclear family nahi hoga which will not in case of nuclear family let me correct it so this will not in case of nuclear family family disputes hoenge hi nahi do log hi rehne honge to na chhi jhagde hone right now moving to the conclusion to reiterate i pen down saying that having a joint or nuclear family totally depends on the interest preference and comfort zone of a person that the person is interested in living in joint family or not प्रेफर करते हैं या उन्हों का कंफर्ट जोन भी चेक करते हैं क्योंकि आप कंफर्ट नहीं आए नहीं जॉइंट फैमिली में रहने वास्ते ठीक है सो ऑल दीज फैक्टर्स आर इंपॉर्टेंट इन चूजिंग अ फैमिली राइट इट्स इधर यू चूज न्यूक्लियर और जॉइंट फैमिली सो दिस वॉज फॉर टूडे इफ यू लाइक द वीडियो डू हिट अ लाइक बटन सब्सक्राइब टू आर चैनल आई मीट यू इन द नेक्स्ट वीडियो टिल देन बाय बाय एंड टेक केयर Q card Q card is very important for cracking the IELTS speaking exam so in this video a Q card and its answer will be given and i will explain that to you so this video is just for your practice purpose if you want to get higher band scores and if you want to answer the Q card efficiently then please watch this video till end now it's time for the question So our question says describe a person who often travel by plane 
So in this cue card you have to tell who this person is, where they go and why they travel by plane. So now we will see the answer. I think plethora of people fly regularly to another countries or to destinations within the country often for professional reasons. Here I would like to talk about my father who is a frequent flyer. He is an organic farmer and its endorser. In different countries, people organize organic farming seminars and invite him. He prefers to travel by plane to visit there. Sometimes he flies twice or thrice a week. He said it feels like a routine to him that he almost sleepwalks through it. He packs minimally to get through security as quick as possible and only takes carry-on luggage with him. The reason why they commute by plane is that planes provide more comfort and facilities. The air staff is very cooperative which makes it more easy for him to go by the plane. Moreover, it is the fastest mean of traveling. All in all, he is the person who is close to me and travel by plane. So friends, this was the answer of our cue card. So friends, thanks for watching this video. If you have any queries, please let us know in the comment section. And for more videos, please stay tuned with our channel. Thank you once again.